Welcome to Rex's Bible Minute, a weekly video where we talk about Jesus, Christianity, and anything along those lines. Uh, we are in our study of Revelation. Uh, we're in week 28, which is pretty crazy. Uh, we've been in this for a long time. Uh, we are on chapter 17 of Revelation, so there's only 21 chapters. We're, we're, we're moving along. We're getting close to the end. So, as always, uh, let's put ourselves back in the train of thought. I mean, we've been studying this letter for so long that it's important that we don't lose sight of what was at the beginning, right? Because, like, it all goes together. This is all one cohesive thought, this this book of Revelation. It's not something that you can just pick and choose and be like, this part and this part, and I like this part. Like, no, it's it all has to fit together because that's the way it was made. So in our minds, we have to make sure we're intentional about that. We've been going all the way through. If you're curious about any of that, go back and watch other videos. Um, but at this point, uh, we are getting to the end of the message of Revelation. And so uh, we, we've been talking about judgment the last couple of weeks and about God's wrath and, and why it's it's a good thing. And if you don't understand what I mean by that, like if you think it's good that God is cruel, if that's where your mind goes, you need to go back and watch the last few weeks because that's not what I'm saying at all. Um, but basically we've, we've talked about how judgment is a good thing and about how, you know, if, if there is no judgment, if there is no punishment for those who are evil, for those who reject love, if there is no making things right, God is not a good God. Um, and how God's wrath, you know, basically God's wrath works two ways. It's it, God allows evil to destroy itself. That's essentially what he does is he allows evil to destroy itself. And then when it threatens to get too far out of hand, well, then he steps in and, and destroys evil himself, and that's basically what these septenaries, these sets of seven, the trumpets, the seals, the bowls, that's what they are. They are God's plan, his 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 rescue plan to finally make things right, to, to deal with the problem of evil once and for all, and to set his creation as he truly desires it to be. Um, and so that gets us to, to chapter 17. The bowls of wrath have done. We're done with the septenaries, and now we get into another parable, essentially. Right, like it started with the parable of the dragon and the beast, um, and, and that was, you know, how evil started and and how evil lost the initial war and how they're fighting another war right now and where the current battle is and and now this is this is kind of picking up where that left off in a sense. We're looking at the beast again, but now we're going to see a new character called the whore of Babylon. So let's get back into that parable mindset where we we're thinking in terms of what we're seeing is not meant to be taken literal. It's meant to be taken. Uh, to represent something deeper, to represent something more in a more powerful way than saying something literal could. So, that being said, let's go ahead and read all of chapter 17, and uh, we'll break it down. So, starting in verse 1, it says, Then one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowls, came over and spoke to me. Come with me, he said, and I will show you the judgment of the great whore who sits on many waters. She is the one with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication. She is the one whose fornication has been the wine that has made all the earth dwellers drunk. And so he took me away in the spirit to the desert. And there I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet monster. It was full of blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was wearing purple and, and scarlet and was decked out with gold, precious stones, and pearls. In her hand, she was holding a golden goblet full of abominations and the impurities of her fornications. On her forehead was written a name, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Whores and Earth's Abominations. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus. And when I saw her, I was very greatly astonished. Why are you so astonished? asked the angel. I will explain to you the secret of the woman and of the monster that is carrying her, the one which has seven heads and the ten horns. The monster you saw was and is not, and is due to come from the abyss to go to destruction. All the inhabitants of the earth will be amazed, all that is, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they see the monster that was and is not and is to come. This is a moment for a wise and discerning mind. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits, and they are seven kings. Five have fallen. One is still there, the other has not yet arrived yet, and when he does come, he is destined to remain for only a short time. And the monster which was and is not, he is the eighth king. He is also one of the seventh, and he does, and he goes to destruction. The two and horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received their kingdom, but will receive their authority as kings with the monster for a single hour. All of these are of one mind. They give their power and authority to the monster, and they will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them because he is Lord of lords and King of kings. 
is those with him who are called and chosen and faithful. As for the waters you saw, he continued, where the whore was sitting, these are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. The ten horns you saw and the monster will hate the whore and will make her desolate and naked and will eat her flesh and then burn her in the fire. God has put it into their hearts to do his will and a, a, with a single purpose, to give their kingdom to the monster until God's words are completed. The woman which you saw is the great city that has royal dominion over the kings of the earth. So, a lot to unpack there. Um, but in order to put ourselves in the right mindset, let's, let's think along these terms. I love the way Tom Wright uh, illustrated this. He says, you know, if, if, if you look at a map, like an old school map, I love maps. I, I could sit and stare at old maps forever. Like I just, I love looking at them. Um, and the reason I think why is because there's mystery involved, right? Like if you look at a map, I'm not talking about like a satellite image map like you get on Google Earth and see. I'm talking like if you look at an old school map or a map that's just the drawing, you see on there all kinds of things. Like if it's a contour map, you see a whole bunch of lines. And if they're close together, that means that it's a steep incline or decline. Or if they're spaced apart, that means it's really flat. Uh, if you see a, a dotted line, that, uh, that could mean a, a border or it could mean a train track. Or you see a hatched line, like it could be a train. If you see blue lines, that could be water. If you see, um, if you see a little sign with a cross on, a little building with a cross, that could be a church. If you see a, a, it could be a hospital. Like you see all these symbols on there and they tell you exactly what's what's going on. But if you go to that place on that map in real life, you wouldn't find the church to look just like the little drawing, right? You wouldn't find the hospital to look just like the drawing. You wouldn't find the library to look just like the drawing. You wouldn't find the train tracks to look just like the line. You wouldn't find the water to be that perfect color blue. You wouldn't find lines on hills and valleys, they show you, they represent what is actually there, but they aren't actually what's there, if that makes sense. We have to think of 17 and a lot of Revelation along those times. It's a map. It shows us what's there. It shows us what's happening. It shows us what's going on, what's going to happen. But it's representative. It's not meant to be taken literal. So we see in 17, we see some very interesting signs on the map. Right, so we get there. We John is taken away in the in the spirit to the, the desert, and he sees a beast and a woman. And so, who are they? Well, if you remember from our parable before, the beast is is Rome, right? It is it is Satan's weapon. It is Nero. It is the empire. It is it is that force which stands in opposition to God. But and and in this case, we see that the beast has seven heads. And that means that there's no doubt it's, it's this, this is Rome, right? Everybody who would have read this in the first century, seven heads equals the seven hills. That's what the angel said. That means it's Rome because Rome famously sits on seven hills. Uh, that's, so it, it, we're not, there's not really any confusion about who the beast is. But we see that the beast is with the whore of, of Babylon, and there's a lot to unpack there because, again, this is all figurative. This is not meant to be a literal whore or literally Babylon. This is all Jesus choosing to, to, to illustrate a point to us. And so, again, we have to put ourselves back in that first century Judeo-Christian worldview that John and Jesus were, were delivering this message to. And so the first thing we would have seen and would have understood is that, that whoredom is in opposition to, to marriage. I mean, the New Testament, Jesus, the apostles, they all taught about the kingdom of God in, in marriage terms. You know, Revelation is going to wrap up with the marriage feast of the Lamb. Why, why would they choose that? It's not, we're not literally getting married to Jesus. It's, what, what does it mean? Why would they use that? God's design for humanity was celibacy or monogamous marriage. It was a unity where two become one. Unity is such a big theme in the New Testament that that's, that's essentially what Jesus is doing at his core. He's bringing unity to a divided divided universe, that, that nature against man, man against man, God versus uh, man. Like we're all separated and only through Jesus and the church are things finally united together. That's what a wedding is. It, it, it is a unity. And so Jesus, when thinking, talk, talking about the kingdom, he put it in terms people would understand that, that two people that were not family now become family. That God and us, who were not family but we were enemies, now become family. And so when they choose to discuss something as a whore, 
That, that's, that, that, that's putting it in exact opposition of what God created it. As a matter of fact, it's more than just opposition. It's, it's truth adjacent, right? If you think back to the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness when the devil came to him and he quoted Bible to Jesus and said, hey, listen, God says this, the Bible says this, and Jesus says, no, that's, that's truth adjacent, right? Like you're taking truth and you're twisting it. Whoredom is, is saying sex, which is a good thing, but you're twisting it into something evil. Right? That's, that's why we see the image of the whore. I mean, and, and Revelation is full of this. 666 as opposed to perfection, 777, or the lambs, 888. Uh, we see it with, with the names, right? The, the monster has blasphemous names. The whore has blasphemous names on, written on them versus the lamb's true name, the, the name of Jesus. Like, we, we see that there's just evil and, and, and Jesus evil and the lamb evil and God, are, they stand in opposition. And there's tons of contrasts like this. And so whoredom is this perversion of something good that God created. Now, I need to make a side note here because uh, this is a topic that doesn't come up very often, but it needs discussed. Um, and so it's kind of irrelevant to what we're talking about, but not. Um, we'll see this more in 20 and 21 about how the things that we do now matter. They carry on into eternity. Like we're not just waiting until judgment day. We're not just waiting to escape this life. Like what we do now really, really matters. And it, it, it lives on. The good things that we do live on. Only the evil and the corruption are done away with. The good things we do, they, they survive on into eternity. But when we're talking about whoredom, we have to understand that this isn't a judgment of sex slaves, right? Uh, the vast majority of people who are in the, the sex industry as far as prostitutes, yeah, they're, they're, they're slaves, right? They're not there because they chose to be. Uh, the number one entry point for sex slavery in the United States is Toledo, Ohio. Like we're, This isn't a, a foreign, far-off problem. This is a problem that's even in my country that is here now, and it's, it's, it's everywhere. It is a horrible problem where people are either kidnapped outright if they're children or they're they're swindled into the promise of a better life by bringing them to Europe or to the United States um, and saying, hey, you'll have this better life. You come in and they get here and they, they're, most of the time the process works like this. And I've done some research on it that they're, they're forcibly addicted to drugs, that they're brainwashed. And I don't mean brainwashed like you th think in movies where you have fancy lights and spin. Like, no, they're just constantly told they're garbage. They're constantly told they're worthless. They're constantly told they deserve what they're getting until eventually they believe it that piled onto a, a drug addiction that they're forcibly pushed into, you, you see that the, most sex workers are, are, are slaves. They're victims. They're not, they're not the people who are the perpetrators. They're not criminals. They're forced into it. Uh, and we need to, as Christians, remind ourselves of that and do something about it. That when we see the issue come up, when we see legislation come up, we need to make sure that it allows for these these sex slaves to be to be rescued, not punished for something they never want to. Tom Wright illustrated it like this. He said it's it, for most of the people who are forced into this, it's like a lobster pot. It's easy to get thrown into, uh, and it's almost impossible to get out of. And most of the time, when you're in the pot, you're just waiting to die because that's what happens in a lobster pot. You're, you're stuck in this this world. So it's I, I know this is kind of tangential to what we're talking about, but. It's, it's something that as Christians we need to raise awareness to, that we need to make sure that we stand united on this front of, of taking care of victims instead of punishing them, which so easily happens. But that's also not the kind of whore that, that, that Jesus is referring to here, that John is referring to here. This, the, this whoredom is somebody who chose it. This is somebody who is seeing an easy opportunity to make lots of money, and that happens as well. It's a small minority of, of sex workers in the world, but it does happen as well. People who choose this life, who choose to, to whore themselves out, to, to, to pervert what God created to be good into something that is twisted and evil. Um, and so that's essentially what the whore of Babylon is. It, is. it is perversion of what God created to be good. And so who is she? She is empire. She is wealth. She is power. She is influence. She is fame. She is fortune. She's all the things that this world tempts us with to pull us away from what truly is good for us, from what truly is as God designed us to be. It's anything that lures you away from Jesus is the whore of Babylon, and she has worked powerfully in the big names as, as far as empire and influence and power and wealth. And the way that she's portrayed, I think, sums it up perfectly. 
Because she's beautiful on the outside, right? She's dressed beautifully. She has fine clothing on. She has jewels. She has gold. Uh, but she's abominable on the inside. She's vile on the inside. She promises reward, but she provides only death. I mean, we got to remember why she called the whore Babylon. Babylon wasn't a power in the world at this time. It's because in the Judeo-Christian world, they immediately would have understood what Babylon was when it was the powerhouse. When it took the people of Israel, when it conquered Jerusalem and took all the best and the brightest and the smartest and the wealthiest people with them and, and put them out and, and across their empire and spread them out, there was a huge temptation there for those people to simply become part of the, the empire as far as they stopped being Jewish. They stopped being faithful to God. They started to worship the idols. They started to worship the kings as, as, as gods. They started doing all this. The, the phrase king of kings is a direct attack on the Babylonian kings because that's what they called themselves. They are the king of kings. There's no king above them. Well, actually there is. It's Jesus. And that's what uh, the Caesar started doing. Like, So we, we see that they're called Babylon because Babylon was the time of temptation. Babylon urged the Jewish people to abandon their, their, their past, this worship of Yahweh, and instead become part of the Babylonian empire. It's where Torah-based Judaism was born. The Judaism that we see today was, was started during this period. It, it evolved after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD to what it truly is today. But that Torah-based, Torah-focused version of Judaism, it started here as a way for people who couldn't access the temple because the temple was destroyed to stay faithful to God. And so the whore of Babylon, that's what essentially she is. She is the pool to worship anything but God. And... She promises us good things. She promises us health, happiness, wealth, power, influence, all the things we could hope. And she offers us a golden cup, a beautiful golden cup. And if you decide to take that cup and go over to what the world offers you, you have to drink it. Only when you start to drink it, it says it's filled with the results of her fornications. The translations, they're not vile enough for what's in that cup. It is disgusting. I can't mention it. I don't want to mention it. But I'll let your imagination go to where you need to go to understand what is in this cup. It is vile. It is disgusting. And once you take the cup, you have to drink it. It is death. And it says that she is drunk on the blood of Christians. That means her traps work. You know, we're, we're put ourselves back in that first century time frame where these people are, 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 are choosing, Christians are choosing to compromise with the world by worshiping the, the, the Caesars, by, by bending the knee to a false god. And her, their blood is now hers. She owns them now. And so we see that Rome, this beast, is in bed basically with the whore of Babylon. That she is his power and he is her power. That they're working together and they are making the, the kingdom of the world serve them. And so we see then that the angel starts to list certain things about the beast. That there are seven kings. And we have to ask ourselves, is it meant to be taken literally? And does it matter? Right? So if you try to take it literally and you go back to the, the first century, who are the first seven kings uh, that fit within this time frame of either middle of the first century or end of the first century when John's writing... The seven kings, I mean, if you go back to the very first emperor of Rome, and you know, Julius Caesar, he wasn't an emperor. The first one was Augustus. Then you have Augustus, Tiberius, Gaius, Claudius, Nero in 68, and then Nero is assassinated, and you have Galba in 69. He only lasts till 69, and then you have Otho, who doesn't last very long. And that would be maybe where John's writing, and then the rumors were, were crazy, were, were that Nero was going to come back, that Nero was either, he faked his death and was getting the Parthian Empire to back his incursion to give him his throne back, or maybe he was going to come back to life or something. Like, you know, again, you had the, they were being worshipped as, as gods, essentially. And, and the angel says that they're, they're the eighth king is one who is part of the seven, but now returns. So he's also the eighth king. It kind of fits with what we know about what was going on politically in Rome at the time. And then you see these ten horns, which represent ten kings, who, who are given power by the beast. That they, they give their power back to the beast. But if these are ten more emperors, well, that puts the writing at like the, the end of the second century. Like it, It's very confusing, which to me makes sense that this isn't 
meant to be something taken literally. I mean, seven, the number itself, that's, that's a number of perfection, of completion. I, I think this communicates that the, the beast's power, Rome's power, is ap- apparently impregnable. It's perfect. It's, it, nobody can destroy it. But then we see these ten kings given authority, and they wage war. They wage war on the whore, attacking what Rome represents, what Rome stands for, which is, is what she is. And in a sense, destroy her. So essentially, I think this is a prophecy about what actually happened, where Rome would be destroyed by its own leaders, by the people within it. I mean, that's, that's how Rome eventually continually divided and divided and divided and destroyed itself until finally the, the Muslims conquered Constantinople, which was still the last vestiges of the Roman Empire a thousand years later, and Rome was forever history. But Rome only fell because of itself, because it was so big and so corrupt and everybody was so greedy and so power hungry that that eventually it tore itself apart, which fits exactly in with the whole message of Revelation that God allows evil to destroy itself. And so what's the point here? What's the point of all of this? Like, what does this matter to us? Uh, what, you know, yeah, great. It's for the first century people who are suffering. We're not. So, how, how does this apply to us? What does this mean for you and me living in 2022? We face the exact same temptation. The whore Babylon is still out there. It's out there in every place that offers you to compromise your faith, to compromise the values and morals that are taught in the New Testament, that are taught in the Old Testament, that God has told us we are to live our lives by, the things that we are to remain faithful to. Everything out there that tries to pull us away from that, that's the whore of Babylon. It's still out there. It's still trying to pull us away from God. It promises us luxury. It promises us happiness. It promises us everything that our hearts could could desire and the result is nothing but death and pain and misery it's only those who remain faithful only those who continue to stay strong and serve jesus that will be victors in the end that's what the message is clear because while the world may seem powerful it may seem to have all the influence we see over and over nothing conquers jesus if you look at the empire of rome it fell it was destroyed It's history. Look at all the other empires throughout history. They have all fallen. What hasn't changed? God hasn't changed. He has always had people who worship him going all the way back to the Egyptian times, to to the Bronze Age collapse, to now. Even before that, God has always had people. The church cannot be destroyed. It will always prevail. The question you have to ask yourself is, are you part of it? So if you have any questions, reach out as always. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.